Hey everybody, welcome to this week's class. Dr. Ben Edwards here, gonna talk about nutrition pillar this week. Um, I'm sure at the end I can throw a little bit of something in about coronavirus, but I think we all need a break from that right now. Um, so let's take a break from it and talk about nutrition, which of course is a foundational piece of your terrain. If you wanna be less susceptible to coronavirus and every other infection and chronic disease. You need nutrients, obviously. Our immune system cells and every cell of your body functions when it's optimally equipped with the right nutrients. So let's dive in. First thing I like to talk about here, because we have patients come in with just so many questions or so many thoughts and preconceived notions or they've tried all the different diets or they've heard conflicting advice from different people and different news reports and they're just confused. And half of them just say, forget it. You know, while, while all the experts are trying to figure it out, we'll just go eat our chocolate cake. Um, so here's some common th questions or misconceptions or headlines, different things that people think. You know, eating fat, doesn't that make you fat? Which, no, it doesn't. We'll talk about that. You know, I've seen headlines, eggs are bad, eggs are good, coffee's good, coffee's bad. You know, fat's bad, no, it's good. I mean, the ketogenic diet's all the rage now, and that's nothing but fat. Um, and what about the six small meals a day versus fasting? And is organic eating really that important? Um, and what about this iron fortified food? I, I preach against iron fortification all the time, but isn't that good? So tons of questions, lots of conflicting things. Nobody knows is what um, a lot of my patients walk in the door with. So we'll address these things. Um, it's good to kind of keep an open mind though and understand that um, especially if you have been dogmatic about a certain dietary regimen. Um, just let's get a little more humbleness about us. And I love this quote from Mark Twain, because again, I have patients come in that some of them think, I just, I know it all. And then we turn their world upside down. Um, so it ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. A couple of things I want you to be aware of. I've, I find some patients of mine, they just worship food like they're addicted to it or, or their diet, even if it's a healthy food choice. Um, it's like this idol, this religion. Don't You can't talk about it. I've heard someone say it's easier to get someone to change their religion than it is to change their eating or their diet. And so we, for some reason, some people, they just put food into this up on this pedestal and you can't even hardly talk about it with them. They just think they have it all figured out and it's almost like a God to them. So careful there. Don't let anything lord over you, healthy or unhealthy, um, is my personal thought on that. Be careful with narrow-mindedness. Um, we get like to get stuck or on just one diet. We think, you know, keto all the time or vegetarian all the time or whatever. Um, so, and division too. I mean, I see this all the time. We have this paleo camp and kind of this paleo CrossFit crowd. And then we've got this Weston A. Price homeschool crowd. And I'm, I mean, I'm making these categories in here too. And vegetarian, vegan, plant-based only and carnivore. And everyone's like in their camp. We gotta be careful there. The vision, in my experience, is not good. Um, and it's a tactic of the enemy in the way I look at it. Um, and the one size fits all approach, obviously that kind of fits in with division. We gotta be careful there. Um, and don't be inflexible. Don't get stuck on just one certain diet necessarily forever. I mean, I have every kind of cookbook in my kitchen, everything from vegetarian to carnivore and keto and ancestral and Betty Crocker, um, Pioneer Woman, <laughs> we have them all, but in different seasons, different times, um, and different people. I mean, you need to have flexibility and know when to go in and out. And when we go to the Betty Crocker cookbook, we're not gonna use Crisco and enriched whole wheat flour. We're gonna use ancestral um, wheat flour, and we're gonna use ancestral fats, and we'll talk about that later. But just having some flexibility, don't get too stuck and narrow-minded is the point I'm really trying to make here. So we're gonna keep it simple um, at the beginning because it can get real complicated and obviously this could be a multi-hour lecture, a whole semester of college you could, or more. You could talk about nutrition and we're gonna kind of try to hit the highlights, give a little bit of evidence and give you practical tips. And the, but the biggest simple statement is just eat like your ancestors. Food and, and how to eat and what to eat used to be intuitive. There used to be a wisdom there and we've totally lost that. 
and people don't even know how to eat. We had one patient, she didn't even know how to boil an egg. And so many people just don't eat real food. They eat processed food-like substances, and they don't even understand what food is. And that's the problem. That's why we're all sick, part of the reason why we're all sick. So in a nutshell, you want to eat like your great-grandparents did. Um, and that can be a wide variety of things, like Weston A. Price. Um, I, I believe I talked about Dr. Price last week. He was a dentist from Cleveland in the 1920s. He noticed an uptick in disease with his patients. And so he and his wife decided to set sail around the world and go observe people groups around the world that were not um, sick, were not seeing an uptick in disease. And so he went to the north, uh, into Canada, went to Alaska, lived with native tribes there, went to the Orient, went to the South Pacific, went to South America, across the Atlantic, Switzerland, and eventually to Africa. So obviously these are very diverse people groups, and the Africans weren't eating what the Eskimos in Alaska were eating, and those weren't eating what the South Pacific Islanders. So there's a lot of diversity, but there were some commonalities, some common themes there, and that's why I like what Dr. Price did, because he could just clearly see modern food made the person susceptible to cavities and disease and tuberculosis. Ancestral food, even though it could be a wide variety, some of these tribes were 100% animals only, the animal products only, others were mostly plant-based. He didn't find any that were 100% plant-based, but there were some that were 90% plant-based. But the point is, it was um, real food. And so it can be a wide variety in different things, but it's not a modern food. That's the main driving point. Eat like your ancestors used to eat. So don't eat this. The standard American diet, or as Weston A. Price called it, modern food. Some characteristics of modern food. Um, you know, I had, a, I had a young kid, a 10-year-old kid, come into my clinic a couple weeks ago, and he kind of made this comment that his mom had already started this diet um, on him. <laughs> and so he was kind of... Um, frustrated with just the word diet. So I got on the whiteboard and drew a line and wrote diet, uh, a definition of diet. Obviously we're all on a diet. A diet just means the food going in your mouth. What food is going in your mouth? So we wrote characteristics of the standard American modern food diet versus ancestral. And here's some of those characteristics. Nutrient depleted, it's especially the minerals. And we'll talk about that later. Pro-inflammatory, inflammations at the is the common denominator of all disease, whether it's Alzheimer's, heart attack, and cancer, or even infections. When you're inflamed, your body's more susceptible for germs and bugs to come in, but also for cellular dysfunction that we end up calling disease. Um, addictive, inexpensive, long shelf life, and readily available. And those last four kind of all go together. To make something have long shelf life, make it readily available and inexpensive, you've got to use certain ingredients and certain um, chemical additives and certain uh, preservatives. And you actually have to remove a lot of the nutrients for it to have shelf life. But when you remove a lot of the nutrients, which really is in the fat, um, you've got to replace that with something that tastes good because when you remove fat from food, it doesn't taste good. So sugar comes in and sugars and salt. And sugar and table salt are more addictive, sugar in particular than cocaine. We'll talk about that later too. Those are the basic characteristics. You don't want to eat that. And I mean, come on guys, just look at that. You could show probably a fifth grader that. Don't label it the standard American diet, but just say, hey, would you want to eat a nutrient depleted, pro-inflammatory, cheap, addictive? No, no one would want to eat that, but this is what we're all eating. So instead, do eat this. And as you'll see here, this is mostly what your great-grandparents would know and recognize. It's an ancestral type of eating, so it's nutrient-rich. Vine ripened and local is best. I know that's hard to do, but when you can, that's what we want to shoot for. Wild-caught, pasture-raised, and organic. The, you know, the word organic, again, your great-grandparents, everybody was eating organic before there was even the label for that, before pesticides, herbicides, and all that was even um, in existence. Everybody since the dawn of time and since we were created, we've eaten organic. There's more nutrition in that. When you have a pasture-raised, wild-caught, organically grown, vine rup and local, you're gonna get more nutrient density. Fermented and raw, these are some um, different techniques. I didn't mention soaking also, but there's some preparation techniques. Obviously, just raw, you're eating it right out of the garden. Um, but the fermentation techniques, before there was refrigeration, we would salt things and we would ferment things and we would smoke things. Um, and it turns out there's more nutrients. You can eat a cabbage, that's great, but if you ferment that cabbage into sauerkraut, the vitamin C content goes up something like 600%. These natural foods are automatically anti-inflammatory, which is great. Um, you need an anti-inflammatory 
um, approach because we live in a pro-inflammatory environment full of stress and full of all kinds of things. Um, another good rule of thumb is um, eat food that doesn't require an ingredient label because it is the ingredient. <laughs> Your great-grandparents would recognize that too and then the organ meats we'll talk about later. Um, a lot of the nutrition is found in the organ meats. All right, so I like to start here. Why do we eat? Um, a lot of people th just think of food as calories and I don't want to get fat, so I need to eat less calories and burn more out. And in the movement lecture, we'll talk more about that. But get that uh, out of your mind. Um, don't even think about the calorie part. I don't, I have patients count calories. I don't really care about calories. Um, here's what I care about. I care that you eat food that has these three things, building blocks for new cells, biochemical reactions, and fuel for cellular energy. And we're gonna break down and go through each one of those, but that's really why we eat food. We need building blocks. Um, Dr. Jerry Tennant is um, a mentor of mine, and he kind of really drove this into me when I was first learning a lot of this stuff. And Dr. Tennant, brilliant guy, graduated from, I think it was Harvard when he was 16 years old, super smart, he's an ophthalmologist. He um, was on the team that invented the LASIK uh, laser for that uh, LASIK eye surgery. Ended up getting sick as he per was performing these surgeries that the smoke, because you burn through the cornea, smoke comes out, and he was breathing that in every time he did a surgery, and he ended up getting a virus. There was virus in the smoke and from the patient. Got viral encephalitis, got very, very sick, was in bed 20 hours out of the day, couldn't practice medicine anymore eventually did get well and he um, got well by just addressing those three things basically building blocks um, uh, biochemical reactions and then the raw material or the energy to make that happen so let's talk about that raw materials your cells the cells you were born with are not the same cells that make up you today so your eyeball cells your skin cells your brain cells your your heart muscle cells these are not the same cells you were born with these cells die all the time and new ones come in all the time. You build new cells all the time. So the rods and cones, these are cells in the back of your eyeball. Every 48 hours, new ones get made. Old ones die, new ones are made. Um, the lining of your gut, every four days, it sloughs off. You got new ones coming in. Every four weeks, your skin. Every eight weeks, your liver cells. Um, your red blood cells every three months. So you're regenerating a whole new you all the time and you've got to have the building blocks and that comes from the food that you eat. Some of this comes from recycling, but also it comes from the food. Next, um, I like to use this analogy of an automobile um, factory, um, like up in Detroit where they make manufacture these automobiles on the assembly line. You've got to have the raw material coming in, but then that's just the raw material. You have to be able to assemble that. That takes workers. Workers are enzymes in the body. You have over 9,000 enzymes in the body, and the enzymes are actually doing the work. They're adding molecules to other molecules. They're chopping certain molecules off of other molecules. So these workers are super important, and these enzymes run off minerals. Thirdly, those workers have to have energy, energy in the form of ATP, and that's where the food comes in. You've got to have fuel to make that ATP, to make that energy. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. So here's a big blurry cell. It's probably blurry on your screen. It's blurry on my screen. The point of this slide is just to show you this is one. This is metabolism. Um, one of uh, the functions of your cell is metabolism that's making energy. This is a network of chemical reactions throughout the cell to make that energy. Obviously extremely complex. If you could highlight just one piece of that, you would get down to the citric acid cycle. And just in the citric acid cycle alone, here's some B vitamins, B3 and B5, B1 and B2, B7, B3. Um, here's some more B1 and 2. But every one of these steps, some B12, you've got to have these B vitamins just to perform that citric acid cycle. And that's not even getting into all the other vitamins and minerals. That's just the B vitamins in just one chemical cycle in the body. So energy, mitochondria, super important to understand this. And if you would go look up kind of the latest research on Alzheimer's, heart disease, cancer, you name it, even autism, all these diseases, it turns out it's a mitochondrial issue. There are books written about cancer being a mitochondrial or metabolic disease and every other disease too. So what all the latest research is showing, when your mitochondria is not working right, you don't work right, and it manifests as disease. So what's a mitochondria? Every cell of your body has these mitochondria. Think of them as carburetors or furnaces. They are making your energy. 
and each your average cell has one to two hundred um, mitochondria, a more energy um, uh, producing or a more energetic cell like the heart muscle. It's beating all the time. It's got five thousand mitochondria. Um, you've got to be able to make energy, but you also have to clear the exhaust. Um, and again, this is what the food will help you do well, or it could help you not do so well, not function well here. We're going to draw this out, and probably the whole nutrition lecture I could just do on this one slide, um, and it would drive the point home well enough. That's a cell. Here's the nucleus with the DNA, which we're going to kind of ignore right now. Remember, you're not your genes. It's epigenetics. Here's a mitochondria. Remember the carburetor. So what's a carburetor in your car need? Fuel. But it also needs oxygen. We'll talk more about the oxygen um, when we talk about the movement video because we move really to oxygenate the body, not to lose weight. Also, we need a spark plug. I'll make that red here, little spark. And the spark plugs in the body, those are minerals, mostly copper and magnesium. But when you have all three of those come together, fuel, oxygen, spark plug, what you produce is energy called ATP. That's the energy molecule. Real quick, we're going to talk about the fuel. You could use fat for fuel here, or you could use sugar. Sugar is also called glucose in the human body. Sorry, my iPad's messing up there. So if you were to consume fat for fuel, here's what happens. It goes through this system and it comes out here and it makes 140 ATPs per every molecule of fat that you consume for fuel. And, forgot to draw in here, exhaust. Exhaust is called free radicals, but just think of it as exhaust coming out the tailpipe in your car. Black smoke versus real clean burning fuel. So when you burn fat for fuel, you make very few free radicals. Lots of energy, very little exhaust. That's fat for fuel. When you burn carb or glucose or sugar through this system, what you get is about 32 to 34 ATPs, and you get a whole lot of free radicals, a whole lot of exhaust. That doesn't mean you can't ever burn carb or eat carb or sugar. It's fine. Your ancestors, your great-grandparents, a study show that about the turn of the century, a pound of sugar could last anywhere from 6 to 12 months for the average American. Today, modern times, a pound of sugar is consumed in one to two days for the standard American, mostly because we're drinking our sugar. It's in all the liquid drinks, Gatorade, Powerade, all the juices, um, of course, soda. Um, but we're consuming a lot of liquid sugar, but then they've also added it to almost all foods. Um, because it's addictive more so than cocaine. I, I don't recall if I told you all about the study with 50 rats in a cage. They gave them cocaine water for a few days and shut it off, gave them sugar water for a few days, shut it off, opened it up to free choice. 48 out of the 50 went to the sugar water because it causes more of a dopamine surge, which is your um, pleasure hormone. That ooh, ah, great feeling, give me more of that. So the sugar's in everything. It's in ketchup, tomato sauce. Uh, you name it. And there's code names for sugar. Anything that ends in O-S-E is a form of sugar. Highly addictive. So we're consuming it. And then the grains, corn, wheat, and rice in particular, those turn into glucose or sugar once you consume them. We'll talk more about the wheat later, modern wheat versus ancient wheat. But my point is a standard modern diet, and that's the same thing Weston A. Price found. It was sugar consumption and processed flour that was um, making people susceptible to cavities, chronic disease, and tuberculosis. It's what we see today. Part of the reason is because of what I've drawn here. You make less energy and you make way more exhaust when all you do is burn carbon sugar for fuel, particularly processed carbon sugar. It's so easy to take this processed, enriched flour and the processed sugar and just burn it through um, this system and produce tons of free radicals. So let's talk a second on the free radicals. As these free radicals get produced more and more and more, you do have a system. It's called the antioxidant enzyme system. These antioxidants come up here and they take care of the free radicals. They squelch them. They donate electrons to deal with that electron stealing free radical. 
These antioxidant enzymes, remember I mentioned the enzymes are the workers. That's what's cleaving things off and adding things on. A great example, when the sun hits your skin, that sunlight triggers a chemical reaction in your skin to change the cholesterol molecule into vitamin D. But that doesn't just presto happen. It's an enzyme that gets triggered that does the cleaving on that cholesterol molecule. Now it's a, a hormone, actually. Vitamin D is a hormone, not a vitamin. So these enzymes are super important. And by the way, that one runs off magnesium. So a lot of this vitamin D deficiency, it's really sunlight deficiency and magnesium deficiency. If you had those two um, appropriately um, exposed to your body, then you'd make your vitamin D. That's another story though. But these are enzymes too, antioxidant enzymes. They mostly run off copper and magnesium. If you remember up here, the spark plugs are, uh, I think I said magnesium and copper. Those are the two main ones. Remember those, because later I'm going to show you some nutrition depletion graphs. Our food's completely mineral depleted, and magnesium and copper are the top two most depleted minerals in our food supply. But if you had enough mag and copper, these antioxidant enzymes would work, and they would come up here and deal with the free radicals. The problem we see in America is we don't have the minerals. We're eating carb and sugar for fuel, so we're making a whole lot of free radicals, and it just overwhelms the system. We don't have enough antioxidant enzyme power in us anymore to deal with the free radicals. So the free radicals will come over here to your DNA, and they will damage your DNA. They will induce um, gene mutations. They will turn on the bad genes and turn off the good genes. Also, these free radicals will come up here to your cell membrane. The cell membrane is where your hormone receptors sit. Hormones like thyroid and testosterone and estrogen and insulin, each hormone has its keyhole or receptor that sit in these cell membranes. If you inflame this cell membrane with free radical production, then these get bent out of shape. All the keyholes get bent out of shape. So we have a lot of patients who complain of low thyroid symptoms even when they're on thyroid medication. And a lot of times it's not because there's an issue with their hormone or their key. It's an issue with the keyhole. The keyhole's been out of shape. This is the root cause of type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance. The insulin's there. In a type 2 diabetic, actually, they have way too much insulin. They have tons of keys. The problem is the insulin can't fit into the keyhole. It's because the keyhole's been out of shape. And the reason it's been out of shape is because of inflammation. And inflammation comes from this excess free radical production and not enough antioxidants to deal with those free radicals. So you get a whole lot done from a health perspective and from an inflammation perspective if you can just get this whole system here working right. If you can get that carburetor tuned up and get your miles per gallon tuned up to 140 miles a gallon and get the exhaust really cleaned up, get your antioxidant enzymes running, get your minerals back here to turn on your exhaust system, and get your minerals back here to turn on your energy system and shift to start eating a little more fat for fuel like your ancestors did and not this predominantly carb heavy um, eating plan that is the standard American diet. Another thing I want to mention, um, this cell membrane, it's made of fat. As y'all can tell, I really like talking about fat. It's because it's really important. And this low fat diet that got implemented in the, from the 1960s on was one of the worst things that ever could have happened. The cell membrane is made of fat. It's a bilipid layer, we call it, two layers of fat. Well, this fat needs to be healthy, anti-inflammatory fat, not pro-inflammatory fat. So omega-6 and omega-3, that's two big groups of fats. You've heard of omega-3 from fish oil. It's anti-inflammatory. Omega-6 is pro-inflammatory. We actually need both. The body does need to have the ability to create inflammation at times, but it needs to be in balance. The average, and that balance is about a three to one ratio. And your average American's consuming a diet that's about a 20 to one, omega-6 to omega-3. We need to bring that back. Part of the problem is the seed oils, like canola, which is rapeseed oil, um, cotton seed oil, soybean oil, corn oil, these um, highly oxidizable oils omega-6 rich and pro-inflammatory. You fill your cell membranes full of those, those cell membranes will be inflamed. Second to that, when you put a cow into a feedlot instead of leave it on pasture, the moment it starts eating that grain, soy and corn in particular, it starts to change the fat content of that cow from omega-3 dominant to omega-6 dominant. A grass-fed cow eating what God intended for it to eat out in the wild on pasture 
will be full of omega-3. There's more omega-3 in a grass-fed roast than there is in salmon. I love salmon too, but beef's not a problem if that beef's eating what it's supposed to eat. So the point is you want to put the right fats in so that the cell membranes, that's part of the raw material coming in. Your body's going to make these cells, and it will use whatever fat you give it to make that cell. And if you give it the right fat, then this cell membrane will be anti-inflammatory, and that's very beneficial for all these receptors that, that sit on the cell membrane. Also, I didn't mention, there's cellular debris and toxins trying to come out of your cell, and when you have an inflamed cell membrane, it's hard to detox. Also, there's oxygen trying to get into the cell, as I mentioned up here, and that oxygen has to pass through seven cell membranes between your lung and that carburetor. And those cell membranes, the anti-inflammatory fats, welcome the oxygen in and allow it to pass through very easily. The pro-inflammatory fats repel the oxygen. And so that's just another reason to fill your body full of the right kinds of fats. So real quick, the wrong fats are the modern ones. Crisco, margarine, um, all the seed oils. It, it takes a very um, industrious steel press to press a hard seed like rapeseed, cottonseed, corn, and soy to get that oil out. Um, as opposed to olive oil, you could do a wooden press and get olive oil out. So olive oil is good, avocado oil, coconut oil, real butter, heavy cream, tallow, lard, just your ancestral uh, traditional fats. Okay. So there's a lot there. Um, just to review, again, this is probably the whole lecture really in one slide. You've got the fuel, you've got the spark plug, you've got the oxygen. It's just like in your vehicle, your fuel line, your air line, and your spark plug to create ATP, your energy. You want to produce high energy and a little bit of exhaust. You want good exhaust clearing system. That's called your antioxidant enzyme system. These run off minerals too. And you want a healthy cell membrane full of good fat. So there you go. There'll be a test at the end. You've got to draw that out. Just kidding. Okay, let's keep going here. This is a pretty smart guy. Lou, uh, Linus Pauling, two-time Nobel Prize winner, arguably the greatest chemist of the 21st century, and he said you can trace almost every sickness, every disease, every ailment to a mineral deficiency, and I tend to believe him. Morley Robbins, um, I've interviewed him a number of times on the radio. He's not a doctor, he's just a medical researcher, and he has concluded there's no such thing as medical disease. There's only metabolic dysfunction that's called by mineral deficiencies. Whenever you see the word metabolic, think carburetor, think energy production. When that cell can't make enough energy, it will become dysfunctional. And that's where all the research, again, is pointing to heart disease is really a mitochondrial carburetor disease. Metabolic dysfunction can't make energy. Same with Alzheimer's, same with cancer, same with almost everything. So here's some examples of magnesium. They've done studies looking at the nutrient content of a food in 1950 versus the mineral levels in the 1990s. And this is what you can see. Back then, you could eat three carrots and get the magnesium that now you'd have to eat 12 carrots to get. In cabbage, same thing. This is copper from the 1990s um, compared to 1950s. You would have to eat uh, 12, 13, 14, 15 different uh, cabbages <laughs> compared to one. There's, I could go on and on and on with all the different foods. I put some here, mustard greens, kale, lettuce, um, and the different things like calcium and some B vitamins, uh, vitamin C. These, this is just a, a sampling. This is by no way a complete list. What this Dr. Don Davis did at UT Austin, he compared 1958 to 1996, 43 different garden crops, and across the board, uh, the nutrient levels were depleted, usually significantly depleted, up to 80% depletions. One interesting thing I like to point out on this slide, the nutrient value declined in recent decades while farmers have been planting crops designed to improve other traits. So there's certain varieties of tomatoes that will be more uniform, more pretty, more plump, um, can have a longer shelf life, they don't bruise as easily, they can travel on a truck and, and take the bumpy ride. These traits are what are planted, you know, plants that can produce um, good profit margins and shelf life. Those are the other traits he was talking about. Farmers were not planting varieties based off nutrient value, so you need to know this. Food producers are not paid per nutrient value. They're paid by the ton, unfortunately. 
Here's an example, um, your traditional like wild greens like a dandelion green and even spinach and this is an antioxidant um, measurement per 100 grams of fresh weight and you can see the iceberg lettuce which is pretty much what everybody eats these days. Very little antioxidant um, compared to an heirloom or a wild type of green. And it's not just the lettuce, it's, I could go through the apples and the berries and you name it, um, they all have the same pattern. And, Heirloom varieties and wild varieties have much more phytonutrient and much more antioxidants. So, but it's not just the breeds and the, the varieties the farmers are planting, it's the actual techniques. Um, so mechanized farming, this is a busy graph. Here's all your minerals in the 1900s versus 1926 when mechanized farming came in. And then we see the next, and every time man comes in and adds some technique or some of his inputs, the mineral level goes down as you can see here in the 1930s, 1940s. Because the plow breaks up the fungi in the soil, the fungi in the soil are needed to um, create the porous, tiny little channels that, to hold the water, like a sponge. You don't have the fungi, you don't have the water holding capacity. What's the water droplets that provide the environment for the bacteria to live? And the bacteria is what's working on the stone and the rock and the pebble and, and the dirt to get the minerals into a water-soluble form. The bacteria can take it from an insoluble rock form into a water soluble form the plant root can take up and put into the spinach and the cabbage and the carrot. So we need the bacteria but you got to have the water and to have the water you got to have the fungi. So mechanized farming disrupts the fungi. We see the mineral content go down. Ammonium nitrates is synthetic fertilizer. It was used in the bomb making factories um, in the World War II times and then the war was over. Um, they had to put this chemical somewhere. They turned to the agricultural industry and it caused the green revolution to come. Um, so it, ammonia nitrate causes a lot of growth, rapid growth and a lot of green, but that rapid growth, it's so rapid, doesn't give time for the trace minerals to come in, so you're nutrient depleted from a trace mineral standpoint. So now you have a weak plant, you got a lot of growth and tonnage, but weak, so you gotta use pesticides, herbicides, fungicides to deal with all the pests that have come into those crops. Now, pests stay away from healthy plants. They only come into sick plants, just like coronavirus, tuberculosis, and all the other germs. When the terrain is not optimal, when you've got a sick cell in a sick internal environment, that's when the germs manifest and are able to take off on you. Same with the plant. So what did man do? Instead of get the terrain right and get the, the plant healthy, we decided to throw in some pesticide, herbicide, and fungicide to kill the germ, to kill the bug, just like we've done with human beings and antibiotics. Now we see antibiotic resistant, just like we're seeing resistance to a lot of these herbicides. And the mineral content goes down more. And the final nail in the coffin, glyphosate. Glyphosate is Roundup. Roundup is a chelator. Chelation means to claw, to grab, and not let go of. So the Roundup will grab minerals and not let go of them. Roundup was patented first, though, as an antibiotic. So Roundup is also killing the bugs in the soil. So now you can see we get to 2010, and there's practically no minerals left. Side note on the glyphosate. Um, uh, there are probably 30 different diseases I've seen graphs like this. I just picked four of them, and these are small numbers, but I'm just going to tell you this, 1980 up to 2010, 1975 up to 20, uh, 2008, 1985, 1975. So basically what this is shown is a correlation. Correlation doesn't mean causation, but correlation should mean, hey, scientists and doctors, y'all really need to study this further and see if you can prove causation. And there's a lot of corollary data between glyphosate, Roundup, and these different diseases. We have seen an escalation of diseases um, that correlate with the amount of Roundup that's being used on our crops. And glyphosate's everywhere. Here's a standard American. I know y'all don't eat like this, but this is what a typical food um, and a diet would have, you're getting glyphosate through your high fructose corn syrup because corn is sprayed. You're getting it on the wheat because the wheat is sprayed. You're getting it with the soy because soy is GMO and sprayed with Roundup. The only reason to genetically modify these plants is to make them immune to Roundup. So they put that gene in there that allows that plant to be sprayed with Roundup and not, not killed. All the weeds will die, although there's more and more weed resistance now. So that food is being sprayed with Roundup, canola, that's the a cheap oil that the french fries are um, made in. Potatoes are now also desiccated with Roundup. My point is you're just getting it when you don't realize it. So to combat that, um, we need to remineralize, and the best way to do that is sea salt. 
Celtic salt, Himalayan salt. Uh, there's a company called Real, Redmond's Real Salt out of Utah. I like that one. I like all three of those. And then um, drops. So there's all kinds of different trace mineral drops. We like this one, Fulvic with ionic magnesium. If you're scared of salt because some doctors told you or you've heard on the news that salt's bad for you, that's table salt. And really table salt's not that bad. It's a very small percentage of patients that have a salt sensitivity. But when you do all the minerals, so table salt is man salt. We need to eat God salt. God food versus man food. This is a great example. Naturally occurring salt has all the trace minerals, 70 plus different minerals. Then man takes that and alters it and gets it down to three. Sodium and chloride and they throw a little bit of iodine in there. Not, not as beneficial. Go for the real thing. These two books go through many, many studies that prove you don't need to be scared of salt. I'm not going to go through those, but look at those resources if you are scared of salt. I try to get two to three teaspoons a day in my diet, shaking it on the food. If I don't get it on the food that day, or especially if I'm fasting, then I just get a teaspoon out and I dump it in a little glass of water and down it. We are desalted, demineralized as a society. Okay, another word on, I like to mention this because there is a lot of evidence that it's not only what you eat, but when you eat. So yes, eat real food, get the minerals, um, eat like your great-grandparents, but your great-grandparents also ate in a narrow eating window, like 8 or 10 or 12 hours, where the average American, their window for eating has expanded. So the alarm clock wakes us up, we grab a cup of coffee and a bagel, and then we're eating all throughout the day, and then we have that snack at 10 p.m. or 11 or 12 at night, and it's this huge eating window. So Dr. Um, Panda at the Salk Institute recently um, published this book, The Circadian Code, and this is what he showed, ancestral rhythms versus modern rhythms. And he's not just talking about sleep. It's our exposure to light um, and it's our exposure to food. And so he did a study where he took these rats, random eating versus eight to 10 hour window. Same food, same number of calories, same everything, except the hour um, exposure to the food was different. And here's what he saw, obesity, diabetes, fatty liver, heart disease, inflammation, all these diseases just from a random eating window. And he, so what I'm saying is at the bare minimum, if all you do is narrow your window, that's beneficial. These rats stayed healthy even though they're eating the same food. Um, Dr. Jason Fung is a uh, fantastic doctor up in Toronto. He reverses type 2 diabetes as most integrative functional medicine doctors do because it is a reversible disease almost 100% of the time. But a, way, a great way to reverse it, remember I said insulin resistance is the cause of type 2 diabetes. High blood sugars, the symptom. Doctors are trained in conventional medical schools to deal with the symptom of high blood sugar by giving a pill, a pharmaceutical, or insulin shots that lower the symptom, lower the blood sugar, but it's not dealing with the insulin resistance, that keyhole that's been out of shape, so the insulin can't fit into the keyhole, that's insulin resistance. The best way to deal with that is don't eat. <laughs> it sounds real simple, but it sure works. Just don't eat, we call that fasting. Americans are the first, modern Americans probably are the only people group ever since man was created to never fast. We're in a chronically fed state. We're never in a fasted state, hardly ever. Or our fasts are super narrow, like six hours, eight hours, and then we're eating again. Dr. Uh, Fung's um, got some great resources and books out there about fasting, and there's lots of other ones too. I've interviewed Dr. Fung. I've interviewed um, Dr. Diagostino from University of South Florida. He's a big um, fasting guy. Um, fasting is super beneficial for you. So just narrow the eating window and you'll get an 18 hour fast. Um, stop eating, you know, at five or six or seven in the evening. Don't eat, um, you know, until the next morning. That's the, you can get a pretty big window. Just skip breakfast, you get um, a pretty big window or even go a whole 24 hours. Eat supper and then don't eat again until the next day. That's a 24 hour fast. Very, very beneficial for our really sick patients and like Dr. Fung and his diabetic patients, um, he'll do extended fasts, three days, four days, five days, sometimes longer. You'll get a lot of metabolic um, rejuvenation. That carburetor will become much more efficient when you're in a fasted state. And also, your most dysfunctional carburetors, the ones that are getting the very lowest miles per gallon and blowing out the most exhaust, the most free radicals, when you fast, your body will actually go through mitophagy, and that means 
these mitochondria just implode. They die. Your body cleans house. It's like a spring cleaning when you fast. And you will take those mitochondria out, the ones that are inefficient. And in fact, a, a whole cell will take itself out. Um, apoptosis, programmed cell death, you'll induce more of that. These cells that are just a little sluggish, more inflamed, not make enough energy, um, and they, especially if they're starting to rapidly divide in an abnormal way, i.e. cancer cells. When you fast, your body cleans those up and takes those out and kills them off too. It's a great way to spring clean. Um, because when you're fasting, what the body's going to do, it's automatically going to flip that switch. I, I said you could burn fat for fuel or you could burn sugar for fuel. It's like you have a switch on your dashboard of your vehicle to burn diesel or gas. And most Americans are just stuck in that sugar burn metabolism. They don't even know they have that switch they could flip. But when you fast, you are flipping that switch to fat burn metabolism beautifully. Um, and you automatically start burning your own fat for fuel. When you eat fat for fuel, though, it continues some of that beneficial metabolic work. Here's a lot of books about fat for fuel for those who are stuck on the thought of, I can't eat fat, it'll make me fat. When we talk about the movement pillar, I'm going to get into detail about calories in, calories out. This thought of burn more out than you put in or I'll get fat, that's not the full truth. It has barely any truth to it. Um, and we'll talk about that in the movement pillar, but here's some great books if you're stuck on that fat notion. Again, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, ancestral, Weston A. Price, what he found in all these people groups is they consumed a lot of good fat, animal-based natural fats, a lot of heavy cream and real butter in Switzerland. Um, the Africans were eating pretty much nothing but animal products, full-fat dairy, the milk from the cow, organ meats, muscle meats, full of fat. Um, that's not how we get fat. Our ancestors weren't fat. We didn't have an obesity epidemic until the low-fat diet came in. It's because we took the fat out and replaced it with carbs and sugar. Carbs and sugar spike insulin. Insulin tells you to store fat. We'll talk about that later, though. Mm. Uh, just a little quick word here. Um, we don't really have time to take a deep dive. I'm going to have another video on this later. Not in this class, but we'll, you'll, it'll be available to you later. About cholesterol, this is such an issue, and there's such a narrow-minded bias point of view and even your cardiologists don't understand this unfortunately guys I'm telling you a doctor can only give you what they've been given so whatever they've been taught is what they're going to teach you and tell you and unfortunately um, our medical school curriculum and even some of these associations like the American Heart Association um, they they are biased and money can influence people's thoughts. And I'm going to tell you where this cholesterol bias came from. You'll see clearly here Ansel Keys. This is after Eisenhower had his heart attack in the 1950s. Everyone turned to Ansel Keys for the answer. Ansel Keys was a nutritionist. He came up with the K rations in World War II. Everybody loved Ansel Keys because he was credited with a partly of why we won the war because of the K rations. Well, Ansel Keys came out and said it was a saturated fat, the cholesterol and saturated fat that caused Eisenhower's heart attack. And he used his seven country study to prove it. And he showed this graph, the countries that ate the most fat had the most heart attack, and it was a pretty amazing correlation. It sure made you scratch your head and think, wow, it could be right. The problem is he did not publish the other studies. He did not show that really there were 22 countries that he had looked at. He cherry-picked. He took the seven that fit his preconceived bias notion and he deleted, omitted the other countries like France. France had the number one highest uh, saturated fat consumption and the very lowest heart attack rates, completely contrary to what Ansel Keys thought, so he just didn't put that in the study. France, they eat a ton of butter. Um, Ansel Keys did come back in 1991 in an open letter to the New England Journal of Medicine and he basically corrected himself and said, oops, never mind. Um, specifically what he said was dietary cholesterol does have an important effect on cholesterol level in chickens and rabbits, <laughs> but it doesn't translate to humans, limited effect in humans, and here's why. God designed humans different than he did rabbits and chickens. We need cholesterol. Cholesterol is the backbone um, for our hormone production. It's the backbone for our, our uh, brain health. We, our brain has tons of cholesterol. We have to have cholesterol to live. And the body's main, going to maintain a certain level of cholesterol. So if you stop eating it, then the liver ramps up its production and you make more. 
If you're eating a high cholesterol diet, then the liver will make less. And that's what Dr. Keyes and other researchers found. The body's gonna adjust up and down based on your consumption because it needs cholesterol. Now, inflamed cholesterol, that is a problem. And it, uh, we'll talk about that more in the other video. So dropping cholesterol levels just to drop them doesn't translate to reduce heart attack and stroke. Dealing with the inflammation in the cholesterol, then you start to see a decrease in heart attack and stroke. There's a great book, Fat and Cholesterol Don't Cause Heart Attacks. I highly recommend that book if you are really stuck in that um, notion that fat's bad and it causes heart attacks. The Statin Disaster by Dr. Brownstein is another great one. Um, I gotta just show this because it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. You'll see these big articles. I mean, this was literally in, in a magazine. Um, they get a famous Dr. Uh, Jarvik here. And he was the inventor of an artificial heart and he uses Lipitor in this big 36% reduction in heart attacks. And guys, I remember when this study came out and the drug reps came into my clinic with this big poster, nice and shiny and bright, with this huge bar graph that showed this huge 36% reduction. But look at this asterisk right here. And then come down here and see what the asterisk says. That means in a large clinical study, 3% of patients taking, lip, or excuse me, taking sugar pill had a heart attack compared to 2% of patients on Lipitor. So number one, 97% of the patients in the study didn't have a heart attack at all. 3% that were on the sh placebo sugar pill had a heart attack and 2% taking Lipitor had a heart attack. So there's a 1% difference. So since when does 36% equal 1%? And I'm not gonna take a deep dive into this, it'll be in a different video, but it's absolute risk versus relative risk. It's a statistical, gymnastical, thing that they do just to make it look better, but the headlines are always going to give you um, the relative risk and not the absolute risk. What you should really care about is absolute risk. That 1% reduction, by the way, that Lipitor provided, the further study into that data showed it was the anti-inflammatory effect of Lipitor that caused any benefit. It was not the cholesterol-lowering level uh, effect of Lipitor that created the benefit. Again, that's another lecture, but I just had to mention that. This I'm going to totally skip because we're going to go over this in the movement um, lecture because so many think exercise is a way to lose weight. No, the way to lose weight is to deal with fat storage hormones. That's just a little preview. I do want to mention modern wheat, and a lot of this is talked about in Wheat Belly. Dr. William Davis is a cardiologist. I interviewed him also, great interview on our podcast page. You can go back and look at that. Um, Pearl Mutter, he's a neurologist, grain brain. Uh, Dr. Wolfson, paleocardiologist. They talk about these things in their book, but primarily about the high carb, high sugar, wheat in particular um, diet that's driving all this inflammation and disease. So real quick, a, a word on modern wheat versus ancient wheat, totally different. The wheat of the Bible in Jesus' day in ancient times, totally different wheat. Modern wheat has 42 chromosomes. Biblical wheat had 28 chromosomes, and the very original had 14 chromosomes. There is some cross, you know, the wind will blow, and these different breeds of wheat, they will cross hybridize naturally, natural hybridization. But 14 to 28 chromosomes basically is what wheat has always had, the natural um, ancestral wheat. When we started hybridizing it in man-made hybridizations, that's when the big problem came in. In particular, 1970, 72, Dr. Norman Borlaug, he won the Nobel Prize for his um, last hybridization to create modern wheat because yields went up tenfold. Dr. Borlaug's hybridization, this dwarf wheat that he came up with, it's 18 inches tall. Ancient wheat from Bible times was five feet tall. Dwarf wheat is wind resistant, drought resistant, and um, the yields are 10 times greater. So he won the Nobel Prize for curing world hunger. But the problem is all this new genetic information, this hybridization created what we see here, a genome for gluten. It's a totally different type of gluten that does not even register on the ELISA test for gluten. So doctors today will test a patient for gluten, sens gluten sensitivity. That particular gluten is so different than biblical gluten ancient gluten, ancient wheat. It doesn't even register the biblical ancient stuff, does it? It's incredible. Um, and that doesn't even go into the nutrient depletion and all the other, the Roundup, the glyphosate that's sprayed on the modern wheat. Um, so here's an example, the ancestral wheat. This is what we have in our pantry at home and we want to cook biscuits or cake or a pie crust or whatever. Now it's still carb. 
it's still going to burn through that mitochondria at 32 miles a gallon, produce a little more exhaust, so we don't eat it all the time. But when we do eat it, it's going to be this, this einkorn, E-I-N-K-O-R-N. One hybridization away is spelt flour. Spelt's probably a little more readily available at grocery stores. These are two good ones. I'd prefer it to be organic. Um, some uh, other options, and we use these all the time too, and this is coconut and almond flour. And these have less, um, they don't turn into blood sugar quite as fast, which is good. Um, and they don't drive inflammation. So those are just some other options. Uh, we'll talk about this in the Peace Pillar uh, um, lecture, but I do like to mention it here. It's more, you know that old saying, you are what you eat, and it's not totally accurate. You are what you can digest and absorb. It's one thing to put food in your mouth. You've got to be able to break that food down. You've got to be able to take that steak, turn it into steak soup, absorbable liquid, you know, chopped up particles. You've got to be able to absorb this stuff. So you gotta have saliva and teeth, obviously. The, the teeth is real important. I, uh, one, a colleague of mine, in his lab, he wanted to study the human digestion, so he made a simulation, uh, a, a machine in his lab um, of the human digestive tract to study different things. But one thing he forgot was the chewing. He forgot to put teeth in this simulation. And he said it was amazing, even with stomach acid, hydrochloric acid, that's an acid that's at one to 2%. Um, uh, battery pH um, similar to battery acid that couldn't even break the food down you've got to chew so chewing saliva but stomach acids important gallbladder enzymes pancreatic enzymes the bo human body has you know six seven eight nine different enzymes to break food down but then the microbiome the bacteria in your gut produces dozens and dozens of enzymes to break this food down so what I'm getting at is you need all those things you need to slow down and chew you need to have proper stomach acid levels, which most people don't. We'll talk about that in the peace pillar also. Stress, fight or flight mode shuts down the stomach acid production. And it is the stomach acid that triggers the gallbladder and pancreas to squirt their enzymes. So if you're missing stomach acid from fight or flight mode and a high sugar diet will also turn off your stomach acid production, you're missing your gallbladder and pancreatic enzymes. If you don't have good gut flora, then you're missing those digestive enzymes. And there are supplements you can take to put enzymes back into the body, and we use these occasionally in patients, but way more beneficial than a supplemental um, enzyme, dietary enzyme, is just get your own processes working again. And that's going to be related to mostly getting uh, to a state of peace, not being in fight or flight mode. We'll talk about that more later. So just to review, um, I want to remind y'all that in a nutshell, and I keep going back to Weston A. Price because he was at this unique time in the world's history when we were changing from ancestral food the way we, we've eaten since time began to modern times. He was right there when the change was happening, and he documented it so well. Um, and, he, and it was a wide variety of food. It wasn't a narrow, everybody's got to eat only this diet or only that diet. It was a wide variety of foods for, in all these different people groups. So I would um, recommend y'all check him out. WestonAPrice.org is a great website. So but we're in, in the closing minutes. I want to hit some practical stuff. So what do I actually eat? Hopefully you're getting an idea now. You want to eat real food. Perimeter of the grocery store, that's where the real food's at. Sorta of better if you could go to the farmer's market. Even better, go straight to the farm or grow it yourself in your backyard. But practically speaking for the masses, it's the perimeter. It's the produce, the meat, and the dairy. That's where the real food's at. The inside aisles of the grocery store, that's where all the packaged processed food's at. That's where most of the nutrient-depleted, addictive, pro-inflammatory stuff with high shelf life. So try to steer clear of that. Um, I don't like to use the word diet because people get stuck on a diet or they just get that idol worship thing going or the division and just all that. But understand people also need a guide. Um, so the biggest thing I would say is at least just don't do uh, this top one, standard American diet. If you're not doing that, hey, <laughs> you, you're well down the road. Um, you know, eat any of these other ones, Whole30, I forgot to put the 30 there, Whole30, but just clean and organic. You know, there's a Mediterranean diet, that's, that's great. So it's kind of a spectrum in my opinion. Standard American at one end, ancestral, paleo, ketogenic, this high fat, 
moderate protein, low carb. In general, that's what we saw ancestrally. If you want to call that keto or ancestral or paleo, whatever. Um, but that's the other end of the spectrum. Any step you make along this spectrum is beneficial. Just reducing the carbs, reducing the sugar, that's beneficial. Just narrowing the eating window, that's beneficial. So, you know, if you're working with your family or friends or colleagues or yourself, um, give yourself a pat on the back and encourage these folks that anything off the standard American is beneficial. So just eat real food, eat the perimeter, um, but then try to get it clean, try to get it organic. As you mature even more in your understanding, get a little more um, into that high fat, moderate protein, low carb. If you want to call it keto, that's fine, or Weston A. Price, that's fine. And Weston A. Price, um, as you'll see, if you look at his, their cookbooks, nursing traditions, and look at the website, they um, recommend ancient grains. They sprout them, they soak them, they ferment them, you know, sourdough bread. Um, so there are ways to consume carb in a healthy manner, but still I wouldn't do a whole lot of it. So if you are already eating pretty clean, but it's still, and even like a Weston A. Price, but you're heavy on the carbs and you're still symptomatic or inflamed in any, any way, really consider moderating those carbs and pushing the fats a lot higher. Get more into a high fat, moderate protein, low carb. You know, if you're vegetarian and vegan, you know, we use those occasionally for a season, for a narrow time period to get a lot of nutrient, um, a lot of phytonutrient, a lot of vitamin and mineral in quickly. Um, long term, I think it's hard, really, really hard, and, and so hard I don't recommend it, to get all the nutrients you need, like retinol. Retinol is vitamin A in a fat-soluble form that's found in uh, animal fats. Beta carotene is in plants, and the body can take beta carotene and turn it into retinol, but it takes a whole lot of beta carotene. And there's many different enzymes having to come in to work on that, and minerals are needed for the enzymes to work to get it over into retinol. Well, we're mineral depleted, stress depletes us, you gotta eat a ton of beta carotene, it's just very difficult, especially if you're already behind the eight ball and you're sick and inflamed and you've been sick. I find it hard long term to, to do vegetarian vegan. Now for a season, um, you know, for a meal, for a week, for a month, for a, a season of time, but coming in with some high quality animal fat, some heavy cream and real butter and some organ meats occasionally, um, I, to, I believe is the best way to go. And, uh, and from my personal belief, I really try to look through the lens of the biblical um, perspective. And in the Bible, yes, the Garden of Eden, we weren't eating animals, nobody was eating animals, it was all plants. I can only imagine what that soil was like and what the nutrient content of that food was like. Y'all should look up a, online. There's a film, Back to Eden Film, uh, .org or .com. But this guy's developed a gardening technique that basically produces nutrient-dense food. And he talks about his garlic being as big as a softball. The cucumbers are so juicy and full of minerals, they taste amazing. So I can only imagine what the real Garden of Eden was like. And yeah, so in that place, you could have gotten all your nutrients that way. And in fact, that was the instruction um, to eat um, food like that, to get all your nutrients that way. And there was no stress um, back then. But then go to chapter 6, I think, in Genesis, coming off the ark after the flood. And God said, I did give you all those plants, but now you're going to have to eat the meat. It was almost like a command. You must eat this meat. And I think it's because God knew what man was going to do in his own ways, in his own strength, in his own sweat of his own brow, and his toiling, and his love of money. We were going to end up with farming techniques like we have today with the plow and the synthetic fertilizer and the pesticides and herbicides and the glyphosate. He knew that nutrient depletion curve was in our future. And these animals, they're like solar energy panels. They take the sun's energy into that plant. They consume that plant. They turn it into all the vitamins we need. And they're like um, saturated. Their muscles and organ meats in particular saturate with all these minerals and vitamins. So I really do believe we need that, but it needs to be high quality pasture raised, not this confined animal operation, mass production of, of what most meats that people eat. I don't recommend those meats. Industrialized meats and eggs I, and dairy, I don't recommend at all. Practical tips, narrow the eating window, reduce the carbs, increase your healthy fats, add this uh, more sea salt and the minerals in, local and vine ripe and fermented, supplement where deficient. Okay, I hope I didn't go too fast. I hope you got a, 
uh, the take home message, eat like your great grandparents. Where I supplement, I'll just tell you is the minerals one or two to three teaspoons of sea salt a day. I do that fulvic, the, the drops, the mineral drops. I squirt that in every drink I drink um, every morning. It's filtered water that's structured. I put the mineral drops in it, a couple of squirts, uh, dropperfuls. I put a teaspoon of salt and I'll put a, a little dash of apple cider vinegar, the raw apple cider vinegar that has the probiotic in it. And, I, that's what, and a squirt of lime. That's my cocktail in the morning and a lot of times in the evening too. Um, so you need the minerals. Also supplement with cod liver oil and I supplement with whole food vitamin C and a little extra magnesium. Magnesium is probably the number one mineral that drives, I said you have 9,000 plus enzymes, roughly. 3,400 of them are magnesium dependent. More than any other mineral, we need magnesium. Magnesium is the mineral we burn through the most when we're stressed out. We're all under more stress these days. So I do extra mag, cod liver oil, whole food vitamin C, and then that um, trace mineral drop basically every day. That's what I'm doing. Sometimes I'll do other things. Um, fermented foods are important, real food. Most people need that high fat, moderate protein, low carb, occasionally fast, occasionally I do high carb and I mix it up, I go back and forth, find out what works for you, learn to listen to your body. If you're eating food that makes you feel bad, don't eat that. Um, you know, really learn to customize this for your own, own self. Talk with the wellness navigators. If you're sick in particular, if you're really inflamed, you may need a, a more dedicated approach and a, a recommended um, kind of dietary uh, program for a time period until you, you're healed and you're well and you're not inflamed and you're symptom free and you're off your pharmaceuticals. Then you can be a little more flexible, a little more intuitive. Last thing I want to say, I know we're at the end here and I can take questions if you'll have any, um, but it is on the coronavirus. If you eat food like this, you will be more resistant to coronavirus. It's what Wes Nay Price found with tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, in my opinion, is much more aggressive and deadly than coronavirus. And these people were tuberculosis free. He called it uh, resistance. They had built a resistance to tuberculosis. Even though their neighbors right down the road were dying from it, the ones eating modern foods, these guys weren't. Um, when the body is equipped with what it needs, your Pac-Man, they're called macrophages, that's what gobbles up your, the coronavirus or every other germ. They'll be highly functional when they can make energy and when they can clear exhaust. You know, people are asking me, what kind of mask should I wear for corona? And I tell them, don't worry about it. God gave you a built-in mask already. And that is the, the hair in your nose and the cilia that line your airway all the way to your lung. That's the mucous membrane. That's the mucus that your mucous membrane makes. But all these mucus producing cells and the cilia and your airway, they need to be nourished properly so they can function properly. And then just inside the lining of your airway are millions of troops. It's like the border patrol agents just lined up ready to not let anyone in or to check every single visitor coming in and gobble up the coronavirus. You have the best filtration system and mask, if you want to call it, already built in. So don't worry about it. Stress will deplete it all. Stress will shut down your immune system. Of course, nutrient depletion will too. And if you're inflamed, your immune system can't work as well either. And the point of eating real food is a low inflammatory state. So be encouraged. This is powerful stuff. Hippocrates, pretty smart guy, said, let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. And he also said all disease starts in the gut. It's just such an important relationship between what you eat, your gut health. We didn't even talk about the microbes in the gut. We'll do that um, in another video. But those bacteria in your gut, they talk to your immune system cells. So if you've got good diversified gut flora, you're gonna have improved immune system, better Pac-Man in there gobbling up coronavirus and everything else. But it's those microbes that get impacted by the standard American diet. 80% of the antibiotics in America today are put into the food, not given out at the drugstore. It's in the dairy and the meat, conventionally grown meats and dairy. That antibiotic decimates your gut flora. Roundup decimates your gut flora. Splenda, the artificial sweetener, decimate your gut flora, birth control pills, all kinds of stuff. So stay away from chemical artificial stuff. It's going to decimate your gut flora. Eat the fermented food. That's the sauerkraut because it's got the bacteria. It's going to bring the diversity back. And that is so much more impactful for your immune system than any, any pharmaceutical you could take to bolster your immune system, any mask, any hand sanitizer, all that stuff pales in comparison 
to your natural defenses if you just steward yourself right. So guys, be at peace. Um, I know we're in a wild, crazy state right now. A lot of it's media just whipping up a frenzy. Yes, coronavirus is going to kill, unfortunately, thousands of people just like the flu. Already this year, the flu, I think I read, I'm not going to quote it because I don't remember. It was 10 times more people already this year have died of flu than corona. And that's typical. Every year, uh, 60,000 people die of the flu, not minimizing those deaths, just bringing some perspective to that. We'll probably have 80 or 100,000 die from coronavirus, a little more than the flu, but very similar. Steward your health. Be at peace. Trust your body's own defenses. Um, I will tell you this. Nebulize some food-grade hydrogen peroxide. You know, if you have a loved one, a neighbor, a friend who's not stewarded their health, they're elderly, they have chronic disease, they're one of those ones with just prone to getting coronavirus and doing poorly, you know, 99% of y'all who get corona will live. So what the stats show, even a standard American nutrient depleted, our body's so amazing and resilient. But if you have a loved one or a relative or friend who is high risk, here's a great treatment. Um, nebulize. So get a nebulizer. That's uh, where you put the medicine in the little cup and it vaporizes and you breathe it in. It's like what asthmatic kids have to do. Two or three drops of Lugol's iodine and three cc's of saline or sterile water. That's awesome to kill these germs in the lung. Same thing with food grade hydrogen peroxide. 3% food grade hydrogen peroxide. 20 drops. Pinch of baking soda. Three cc's of saline or, or sterile water. Load up on the cod liver oil, that's your vitamin A and D. Load up on vitamin C. If these guys are sick and coughing and fever, give them vitamin C to bowel tolerance. That means until they start having loose stool and then back off a little bit. That's, you know, every hour, let them sip on a little vitamin C mixture that you make them. If they are in the hospital, try to convince the doctor to put some IV vitamin C on them. The intravenous vitamin C is multiple, multiple studies showing decreased mortality, big drops in mortality. Um, with the vitamin C. So there are treatments. I was just on the phone, got off the phone, two doctors in Italy through a translator were talking to us about ozone, which we use ozone in our clinic. Ozone is oxygen. It's O3 as opposed to O2 that you breathe. And there are finally, the hospitals in Italy allowed them to use this ozone intravenously. And these doctors were reporting great success with ICU patients on the ventilator coming off the ventilator in a couple of days with the IV ozone. So I know that's probably not going to be accepted here in the U.S. Um, in the hospitals, but you can find an integrative doctor in the area and they could do that. The vitamin C drips are more um, accepted potentially in the hospital. Um, so those are for your sick friends and neighbors and loved ones. Um, there are multiple studies, 100 years worth of data on ozone. Lots of studies published, even in JAMA on vitamin C. So y'all be encouraged. Lots of great natural therapies. Unfortunately, they're not patentable. So I didn't learn about them in medical school. That sounds jaded, but it's true. I'll quit talking because I feel myself going on a tangent here. Um, you know, go to the YouTube channel and look up. I did videos already on vitamin C and other stuff, and we'll try to put some more stuff on there regarding corona. So um, y'all don't freak out about that. I know you're not. Be at peace. Keep stewarding your health. Next week, hydration. It's going to blow your mind. Hydration is way more than eight glasses of water a day. In fact, that's not even uh, correct. Um, so next week, hydration, then we'll do movement and peace. So look forward to continuing the class with y'all and get with the wellness navigators. Um, do some one-on-ones with them. Get your specific questions answered there, unless there are any. There's one question. All right, one question. Uh, where do I get nutrient-rich soil for my garden? Nutrient-rich soil. Where do I get that for my garden? Good question. <laughs> Um, a good organic um, garden facility in your area would be a place to start. I mean, they make bags of organic potting soil and organic soil that would get a little pricey. If you had the time, the Back to Eden technique, backtoedenfilm.com, uh, just look that up. And basically all you're going to do is cover your soil. He covers it with wood chips. He talks about you can cover it with other things. That's going to naturally develop your soil into the richest organic soil imaginable. Um, regenerative or biodynamic farming is kind of the new catchphrase. It's beyond organic. It's actually regenerating the soil. And if you could maybe Google or search um, in your area for a regenerative or biodynamic farmer, we're going to start working with some here locally um, to really promote this on a mass scale to the big con conventional farmers in our area. Um, but you might be able to find one locally who could help you with that. But basically, it's going to be composting. Uh, talk to your local organic um, 
gardener, and there is a West Texas Organic Gardener.com. I'll try to have that next week, maybe. One of our patients does a lot of organic gardening here locally and has a great website with great resources. So um, we'll have that next week for you. Okay, everybody. Y'all be blessed. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for being with us today.